Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. In part one of Exploring Starlight, we learned what we can find out about a star from its brightness and spectrum. In part two, we learned how to classify stars using the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And in this last video of the series, we'll discuss why some stars vary in brightness and what this can tell us about them. We'll also look at astronomical catalogues and star trails. All stars vary in brightness over time. The sun has been getting gradually brighter. It's now 48% brighter than when it entered the main sequence 4.6 billion years ago and is increasing in brightness by about 1% every 100 million years. The sun's brightness also varies in regular cycles. The most important, called the solar cycle, is an 11-year cycle in which the sun's brightness varies by about 0.1%. See the sun part 1 for more on this. But some stars vary a great deal more. These are called variable stars, and we'll discuss some of the most important types today. We'll start with Cepheid variable stars, also called Cepheid variables, short period variable stars, or often just Cepheids. These stars pulsate, growing and shrinking with a cycle of a few days or weeks. As they expand, they cool, becoming dimmer, and as they contract, they heat up, becoming brighter. Their magnitude changes by about 0.5 meaning their luminosity varies by about 60%. This is often noticeable through careful naked eye observations. They were first noticed in 1784, and today the internet connects small groups of dedicated amateur astronomers who make meticulous records of these variations. Cepheids are very bright O or B type stars, several times as massive and thousands of times as bright as the Sun. They are giant post-main sequence stars, fusing helium in their cores and about 600 are known in the Milky Way. Cepheids are especially important to astronomers as we can use them to find the distance to objects in our galaxy or further away, as I'll explain. In 1784, John Goodrick, an English amateur astronomer, noticed that Delta Cephei varied in brightness over several days. Similar stars were soon found and they were named Cepheids after that first one. We can plot brightness against time on a graph to show a star's light curve. Here is a plot of the variability of Delta Cephei, with apparent magnitude on the y-axis. There is a clear curve here, so we can trace a line of best fit. Now we can estimate the period of the star. Find the time from one peak to the next. In this case, it's about 5.4 days. In 1908, American astronomer Henrietta Swan Leavitt analysed thousands of stars in a nearby dwarf galaxy, the Small Magellanic Cloud. These stars included several Cepheids, and she found that their period was directly related to their apparent magnitude, with brighter stars having a longer period. And because they are all in the same galaxy, they are all about the same distance, meaning this relation also holds true for their absolute magnitude. Astronomers then used parallax to measure the distance to a few nearby Cepheids in the Milky Way to determine their absolute magnitude. Combined with Swan Levitt's data, they developed the graph shown here. We can now observe a Cepheid to find its period and use this graph to determine its absolute magnitude. We measure its apparent magnitude and use the distance modulus formula to find its distance. We've used this method to determine distances within the Milky Way as well as distances to other galaxies. See Exploring Starlight Part 1 if you need a recap on the key terms used here. Some red giants nearing the end of their life are unstable. They expand, fusing hydrogen, and then contract, fusing helium, in a cycle with a period of 100 days or more. These are called long period variable stars, or mirror variables, after the first such star to be identified. This cycle causes big changes in the star's size, temperature, and luminosity. Mirror's apparent magnitude varies from 10, invisible to the naked eye, up to magnitude 2, one of the brightest stars in the sky, over a period of 332 days. Long period variables expel a lot of mass as they expand and contract. They can even emit masers, microwave lasers, as shown by the red spots in this diagram of S. Orionis. Here we can see the light curve of a typical long period variable star, Chi Cygni. The raw observational data is on the left, and the curve of best fit on the right. You can see its period, measured from one peak to the next, is about 400 days. Remember that magnitude is a negative scale, 
so lower magnitudes mean brighter stars. Chi Cygni's magnitude varies by nearly 10, meaning that at its peak it's almost 10,000 times more luminous than at its minimum. In extraterrestrial life, we discussed the transit method of finding exoplanets that obscure their parent star from our perspective. Similarly, some binary stars orbit each other such that the stars sometimes eclipse each other. We call these systems eclipsing binaries. Most of the time, we can see the light from both stars, but when the brighter star passes in front of the dimmer star, the total light observed drops. And when the dimmer star passes in front of the brighter star, their total light drops further. This light curve shows the binary system KIC 10661783. The deeper dip on the left shows the dimmer star passing in front of the brighter star, and the shallower dip on the right shows the brighter star passing in front. The period of this light curve is the orbital period of the two stars around each other. In this case, you can see it's about 25 days. We've got two more types of variable star to look at, and these types generally don't go through cycles like the last three. Nova is plural for new, and refers to a new star. The plural is novae. Novae aren't actually new stars. They're old stars which were too faint to be seen, but suddenly increased in brightness. Novae occur in binary star systems. First, one star reaches the end of its life and becomes a white dwarf, with extremely high surface gravity. Sometime later, the other star expands into a red giant. If its outer layers get too close to the white dwarf, the white dwarf's extreme gravity can rip away some of the red giant's matter. The white dwarf absorbs the stolen gas and gets hotter and hotter until its surface reaches 20 million Kelvin. At this point, nuclear fusion begins in the outer layers of the white dwarf. This is extremely unstable. A huge amount of hydrogen is fused very quickly. Extreme amounts of energy are released very quickly and the white dwarf explodes. It reaches an absolute magnitude of minus 8 and then fades over a few weeks or months. This only expels a small amount of matter and after the nova dies down it might repeat this process, gathering more matter and going nova again a few decades later. Every year there are about 50 novae in the Milky Way but only about one per year is close enough to be visible to the naked eye. The hot matter released by a nova forms a nova remnant. This gas shines from its own heat and from the radiation of the binary stars. As it expands, it cools, eventually fading from view. Here you can see the binary system GK Persei surrounded by its nova remnant, the Firework Nebula. GK Persei exploded about 1,600 years ago and the nova was seen on Earth in 1901 at a maximum apparent magnitude of zero. This is the typical light curve of a nova. Brightness increases rapidly, peaks, then decreases, quickly at first, then more slowly over several weeks. Novae are among the brightest stars in a galaxy for a few weeks, but supernovae can outshine an entire galaxy. A type 1 supernova is like an ordinary nova, but the amount of matter absorbed from the white dwarf's companion is so high that the white dwarf is utterly destroyed in the explosion. If any mass does remain behind, it collapses into a neutron star. A type 2 supernova is the fate of a star more than eight times the sun's mass. At the end of its life as a supergiant, fusion finally ends. Gravity takes over and collapses the star at a quarter the speed of light. The collapse takes just a few milliseconds, but releases a billion times the energy our sun will emit in its entire lifetime. The resulting explosion is hundreds of billions times brighter than the sun, though this too will fade over several weeks. Novae leave behind nova remnants, and supernovae leave supernova remnants. They're different but similar. A supernova remnant is made of the outer part of the exploded star, a cloud of gas and dust that expands into space, cooling and getting thinner, and eventually becoming nearly invisible. Supernovae are rare, the last one visible to the naked eye was in 1987, and the last one in the Milky Way was in 1604, but the supernova remnants can be seen for centuries after. We think we get on average one supernova in the Milky Way every century, so it seems we're a bit overdue for another one.
the light curve of a type 1 supernova is almost identical to that of a nova. Here we can see the light curve of a type 2 supernova. There's a lot of complex and interesting physics going on here, resulting in several bumps in the curve, and sometimes the middle section can be almost flat. Some astronomers spend most of their career studying supernova physics. For the GCSE, you should be able to sketch light curves for these five types of variable star, identify the type from its light curve, and explain the reasons for its shape. Next, we'll discuss three types of star groups, groups of stars bound together by gravity. The first is binary stars. These are pairs of stars which orbit their common centre of mass. Our nearest neighbour, Proxima Centauri, orbits Alpha Centauri every 550,000 years. In 1689, a Jesuit priest, Father Jean Richaud, discovered that Alpha Centauri is itself a binary star. Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B orbit each other with a period of just 80 years. You can see these three stars here, although Alpha Centauri A and B can't be distinguished, and the dim Proxima Centauri is barely visible. An open cluster is a group of hundreds or thousands of stars. They form from the same interstellar cloud and are generally young stars of similar age. They are bound together by gravity, but only loosely. Their weak gravity means they don't form a specific shape, and they can easily gain and lose members as they move through the galaxy. They typically last a few hundred million years before most or all of the stars have dispersed elsewhere. Open clusters look like a faint blur to the naked eye, with maybe a few individual stars. A telescope can reveal many more individual stars, like in this photo of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. Through the telescope we can see a lot more than seven. Open clusters have hundreds or thousands of stars. Globular clusters have hundreds of thousands of stars. They form from a much larger interstellar cloud, and are typically older stars of similar age, having formed roughly at the same time as their galaxy. Since globular clusters have so many more stars, their gravity is much stronger than open clusters and they form a spherical shape. While open clusters are typically found in a galaxy's spiral arms, globular clusters orbit the galactic core in a halo around the galaxy. Here you can see Caldwell 42, about 42 kiloparsecs away, and roughly 300,000 times the mass of the Sun. We're going to move away from stars briefly to look at astronomical catalogues, lists of other objects in space. Charles Messier was an 18th century astronomer interested in comets. While observing, he made several false discoveries, fuzzy objects that, on closer examination, turned out to be boring. To Messier, boring meant anything that wasn't a comet, and he carefully noted their appearance and location in the sky to avoid mistaking them for comets in the future. Later astronomers named this the Messier Catalogue, and found the nebulae, clusters and galaxies in it actually quite interesting. Messier included 103 objects, and seven more were added later. They are referred to as Messier, followed by their number. The Andromeda Galaxy, for example, is Messier 31. This is sometimes shortened to M plus the number, M31. Messier was French, so the Messier catalogue only includes objects visible from France, about 45 to 50 degrees north. Here you can see photos of all 110 Messier objects. In the 19th century, Danish-British astronomer John Louis Emil Dreyer was interested in Messier's boring objects and produced the new general catalogue. This is widely used today and is a development of previous works. Originally with almost 8,000 objects, later supplements brought the total over 13,000. This catalogue was a collaborative effort, with astronomers all around the world observing the whole sky. This led to a few errors, such as duplicates, or nebulae that actually turned out to be ordinary stars. Objects in the new general catalogue are referred to by NGC, followed by their number. For example, the Cat's Eye Nebula is NGC 6543. Our final topic in exploring starlight is star trails. Stars move over the course of a night, or rather they appear to, as the Earth rotates. A long exposure photograph like this one shows the stars as trails, as an arc of a circle. We can use these trails to measure the sidereal day, the time it takes the Earth to rotate 360 degrees. First, we identify the celestial pole, 
the centre of the arc's circle. Next, choose a clear star trail, one not obscured by clouds or the landscape. Measure the angle the star travelled while the photo was being taken. In this case, the angle is 33 degrees. We also need to know the exposure time of the photograph. For digital photos, this should be recorded in the file properties of the photo. In this case, the exposure time is 2 hours, 16 minutes and 6 seconds. It's easiest if we convert this to seconds. So here, it's 8,166 seconds. So, in 8,166 seconds, the star moved 33 degrees. How long will it take to move 360 degrees? In other words, how long is the sidereal day? Use the equation sidereal day equals 360 degrees divided by the angle times the exposure time. So 360 degrees divided by 33 degrees times 8,166 seconds. This gives 89,083 seconds or 24.75 hours, 24 hours 45 minutes. You should learn this equation and be able to use it in the GCSE exam. The true sidereal day is 23 hours 56 minutes, so we were a bit off here. For better accuracy, we need exposure times as long as possible. We should also choose star trails as far as possible from the celestial pole and calculate an average from several stars. Also bear in mind there can be some distortion when you turn the celestial sphere into a flat photo so this could affect your angular measurements. That's it for this three-part series on exploring starlight. Thank you for watching, goodbye, and have an excellent day.